שלום, שלום. שלום. מה שלומך? בסדר. הילה, הילה פאר, אתם באיזה שלב אתם רוצים להציג? לא יודעת, אבל תכף שר יגיב להעיף. היום אני מרגיש נדיב היום עם הגמישות של ה... מתי תרצו להציג? יש מצב נרצה עכשיו, שר? אפשר. עכשיו בכל מקרה לא, כי אם כן אני רוצה להציג קצת דברים... לא, אני רוצה להציג... רגענת על הכף. אני רוצה, החלטתי להכין כמה שקפים שרלוונטיים, ואז... I'll turn to English. So you prefer that I'll start now and, uh, and, and so you want to present as early as possible? I think so. Yes. yes. I think so. Okay, so let me see. Where is the... I have now multiple presentations. So I need to see where is the presentation that I wanted to start with. Before that, any, any special things that you'd like to say about class, about projects, about, uh, I think everybody here, uh, about the uh, paper presentations, about the project days that I forced on you at the, at the summer vacation. Okay. Uh, next week, we're going to have I'm, sh I'm share screening, not yet, right? Next week, we are going to have a guest lecture uh, by uh, Tal Shai uh, from the Department of Life Sciences in Ben Gurion. She'll give us uh, some, uh, some background on what is called uh, systems biology. Uh, by the way, she's also affiliated with our uh, department with the uh, uh, software and uh, information systems engineering. So. Uh, so she'll present the next week part, about one hour, uh, one hour. I asked her for one hour, but I said that we're flexible. So if she'll take more time, like Tammy did last time, it's fine. Uh, and we, the week after that, we're going to have another guest lecture by uh, Paul uh, Willutrex, who is a, a new uh, faculty at the... Uh, at, uh, at, uh, at the interdisciplinary new institute in uh, Marseille. Um, so, uh, so please be on time for the next two lectures. It's important, I mean, be on time, uh, as always. I mean, everybody that here is on time, I guess, but you know, just. And then we're going to have the last week, which, uh, yeah, then we're done. Okay. So now you can see my screen, right? So this is a paper that uh, I already showed you guys when we talked about the predicting a uh, cell state uh, with deep learning. Uh, but what I wanted to show is uh, because uh, Eli and Sarah are work are going to present paper on basically the same problem of predicting, uh, looking at, uh, at um, uh, taking a temporal process and following it uh, computationally, putting like scores on a, on a, on a continuous uh, project, a uh, pro process, and specifically also the, the easiest uh, process uh, that, uh, that is, uh, has a temporal order is the uh, cell division cycle. Right, so the cell, cells are uh, creatures that uh, can divide and become one cell can become a second cell. And there are very clear, very uh, well-defined states in terms of the, of the, uh, of the trend of, the, of, the, of this process. So the cell partitions from one state to another to the third. And this gives a very, and there are also molecular markers. So in principle, you could, uh, either fix your cells and, 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 and mark them and see in what state they are, uh, or there are even uh, Eli and Sao are going to show us a live imaging of a marker that allows us to, 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 to understand the, states of, uh, the, the state of a cell in the cell cycle. Uh, but of course, I mean, it's, it's, it's always hard to, to, 
uh, technically, right? And to, to, to introduce a fluorescent uh, protein within our cells and, uh, and, and, and it will be much easier and will free us a chan channel or channels if we'll, if we'll have a, a, a quantitative assessment without the need to annotate, to, to mark the cells, explicit, to label the cells explicitly. Okay. So I just remind you, uh, this paper from 2017, they used something that is called the flow cytometry, which makes uh, our life easier. First, it's fixed, so it's not, there is no live imaging there. The cells are, and, and they go through this uh, flow cytometer, and then you can have images of the cells. So this is a bright field image and this is the dark field image. And then what they did, basically they put it into a network and they uh, used the classification uh, to the different uh, uh, cell uh, uh, states, to the, to the cell cycle states. And also they used the one of the, one, the, the, the one before last uh, layer uh, for visualization purposes and perform the a TCD visualization to see how it looks. So, uh, I mean, this is a cool problem. Also, I meet in there from, I meet from here in the, the student in the course. I meet, uh, uh, yeah, she says hello. Uh, in her project, she's also looking at the temporal process and trying to characterize it to score where you are along a trajectory. Just, of course, she's taking a much more exciting problem uh, on cell differentiation. It's minute. So she's looking at cells that are changing from being uh, stem cells to specific muscle cells and trying to put scores on the, the intermediate stages of this process, which is of course also not as well characterized as the cell cycle, but the, but, but the classic problem for this is the, is the cell cycle. Now, uh, looking at the fixed cell images, not live imaging, uh, there, there, there is a lot of uh, work in, in the field of uh, systems biology, which we're going to hear about uh, a, a little more next week from Tal Shai, as I said. Uh, basically, they have, uh, uh, they, have, they have a very attractive uh, setup for data scientists where from each cell they can extract, uh, I don't know, several thousands of numbers, hundreds or thousands of numbers that represent the, the RNA levels of each cell, which is, which is uh, quite amazing. I mean, it's, uh, as a data, I mean, there are a lot of issues there, but as a data scientist, you have, uh, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of measurements, uh, and each of them have a specific meaning, which in microscopy, we do not have. Um, and and, and this, this is a very fast growing field, and we are going to hear about it more next week. And, and, and I really like some of the computational work that is uh, done there. Uh, just to advocate for, uh, for why microscopy is much cooler. Uh, what we have in microscopy is, that they, I mean, they have the readouts, which are already, you know, feature vectors. You don't need to deal with uh, images and you have a, a, a high dimensional vectors that present very clear specific molecular, uh, 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 well, RNA levels within each cell, uh, which in images it's much harder and we don't have these numbers of proteins as you, as you know. Uh, that we can image uh, simultaneously within a living cell. But what, what do we have? First, we have uh, proteins and not RNA. So the central dogma in biology is going from DNA to RNA to protein. And the protein are, are the ones that are actually doing this, doing the, are, are the machines that are actually doing stuff within our cells. So if we can see the proteins, we, can, we are closer to the actual function of the cell, which is a big advantage. And it's not a, there is no simple linear relation. So if you see an RNA that is, uh, I don't know, high, that you will not necessarily see the, 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 the corresponding uh, protein that you have, right? I mean, the, the, the relations are not trivial at all. So this is, a, this is a one thing. The second thing is that uh, we have spatial information. Now there are also spatial information. So we know where a cell is in the space, where a cell is in, in relation to other cells, where a molecule is or an organelle of a cell is in relation to other organelles, which is something that uh, with the single cell RNA seq you don't have this data. Now there are actually uh, methods that I think we even won uh, a method of the year award uh, last year, uh, 2020, on, on doing spatial transcriptomics. So, so it's actually putting uh, understanding where 
where things came from. And, and this gives a lot of information because you can start see what lights up in what region of whatever, of an organ or something. And uh, the third advantage that the only microscopy has is a uh, time. Microscopy can be used for live imaging. All the measure, all the readouts that we are talking about, uh, all the proteomics, uh, single cell elastic, uh, 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 all of these measurements, even if, if they are at the single cell level, and even if you have spatial information, that's it, you don't have the temporal information. So why, why is it related? Because uh, what, they, what they did in this field, they devised methods for pseudo time, to measure pseudo time. So to define where you are along a developmental trajectory uh, uh, based on, on snapshots of images. So you cannot live image a process, but if you have snapshots from many, many, many cells that are, are spread along the whole process, you can start build trajectories along this space and understand and put scores on where you are along this space. Okay, does it make sense? Question? Questions? Can you follow? No? Yes? Maybe? Mushroom? What is not clear? Are you even following me or are you doing other stuff while well, I'm, I'm just excited, I, exciting myself and everybody else are doing uh, writing emails or something? Uh, how this one differs from the first one? Hmm? How this uh, um, paper differs from the first method you showed up, yes, aside from the usage of uh, um, the uh, flow through micro microscopy? You mean this paper or this yeah. one? No, the second one, how it differs from the first one. This is the first one? What is the yeah. first one? Yeah, yeah. This, is, this one is the Uhlenberg. This is the this first is... one. And this, I, didn't, I, didn't tell, I didn't say it, uh, what they did in the second paper. I'm, I'm oh. sorry that I okay. background because, because this is where it came from, right? It came from, okay. and if you look at it, this is what is called pseudo time. Pseudo time because you never have the actual time. Uh, and the idea there, and, and sometimes they realize that when they take their data, they do, so for example, they take a developmental process or they take a disease process, a cancer progression and whatever, and they, they take their data, which is again, a high dimensional vector and they project it with some, just with, with the PCA or something. And their, their first component is going to be a lot, of a lot of time is going to be the time, right? So time is very important. If you have something that is transitioning through states, time could be in an unsupervised manner they the, can be the, 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 the most uh, effective uh, the, uh, um, quantitative description of the variability within the data, okay? So this is what they did, uh, what they did here in uh, following developmental path trajectories, what they did, uh, so they use mass cytometry data, basically it's again, I mean, you have for single cells, you have vectors, and uh, what they did, uh, they devised the measures that is based in similarity, they, uh, they, show, they did a network-based uh, similarity measure. I'll show you in the next slide, I think. Uh, the cool thing here that I wanted to mention is that the, the, the same idea was used by, by, by another paper, by this one, Gat Tadmor and Al, that was also, one of the, of the people here is actually Dana Peer, who is the, the, you know, an Israeli that is now in, uh, in the Memorial Sloan Catering uh, Cancer Center. And, uh, and uh, what they did, they did the same thing on images. So I'm, I'm going to show you what they did, but in principle, what they did, they divide similarity measurements uh, based on uh, features that came from the images. 
And then based on that, they had a, a trajectory that, that, got, that went from the cell cycle, you know, initial stages, stages of cell cycle to later stages of cell cycle. And in this paper, they, one of the highlights was that they could also look at the role of the microenvironment. So here you look at single cells, but the cell cycle is also dependent on what happens around you. If you are in more crowded environment, you're going to look and behave differently than if you are just a, a cell alone. And they took that very nicely into consideration. So I'm going to show you this paper. So first, uh, they had these were the images, and they did image processing to identify the single cells and segment them and measure uh, properties of the cell um, and measure properties of the cell. As you can see, uh, and 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 also what they could do is uh, is uh, is. Um, uh, labels their cells with markers that are correlated to the same cycle, and this would be your their ground truth, right? And then they can could measure uh, different parameters. So in this case, you can see the local cell crowding is a parameter for how dense local density of the of the of the of of, of the cell. Even in the same plate, you can have very different local density. So in one region, cells are really dense; in others, are less dense, etc. And then you can they can measure other properties such as the, the nuclear area and, and, and measures that relate to uh, to uh, cell uh, division. And now what they did in the in the last picture the the arrows what are the meanings the distance? Yeah, so they measure distances between the cells and based on that they decide this is a measure for local crowding. And once you have that, what what you what they could do is take their um, take their uh, features, right? For each uh, cell, they have a feature. And 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 basically, here you see dimensionality reduction. It's actually not dimensionality reduction. Here it's actually the the a, a, a visualization of different parameters that they could measure. So that they could measure that I related to the cell division where you are along the cell division progress. So, so this is basically the kind of gives you information about the ground truth. But what they could do in order to show that they could, they could start by, the, by, by creating, taking features that they extracted from, uh, from the features that they extracted from the, from the images. And then they, they uh, looked at their nearest neighbors. And based on that, they decided on where to put the uh, 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 edges between nodes. So each node is a cell. And when uh, you see an edge between uh, two cells, uh, you know that it's a K nearest neighbor of another cell. OK? So they take a small K. And now you have all the, and, and, and now you look at all, all your uh, neighbors. And this creates a network, a graph, right? A computer science graph. Once you have this network, this is now a, a, a traje you can you can look and, and look for trajectories. So you are saying if you want to, you, you can take the cells that are in early stages of uh, the cell division cycle, and take cells that are at later the uh, stage of the cell division cycle, and now you can build trajectories that go goes between them and you can see, and, and, and basically now uh, uh, you can look at the distance between a, a given cell to the, the, the initial point or the end point, and based on that, decide what is the state of a cell, right? There, there, is a, there, is a, 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 there are some tricks here on how to make sure that your, uh, your trajectories are not going to regions that they're not supposed to go. So they, they introduce waypoints, which are kind of constraints on how the trajectory should go. But in principle, this is the whole idea. And what they call the CCT, which is the cell cycle trajectory, maybe, uh, is, is a, a, and is color coded here, is a, this distance. So how basically in here you can say how far you are away from the starting point. And this gives us a, a continuous measure for where we are at at the same cycle. And you can see that this trajectory that you see here color-coded is actually very similar to what you would uh, expect from 
ground proof measurements of that are related to the to the cell cycle, which are the three parameters that you can see here. Okay. Asaf, how did they uh, place uh, dots on the on the coordinates? I I understand that uh, there is a K nearest neighbors that uh, makes edges between nodes, but what places them on the graph? Ah, the graph here. This is just an yeah. uh, illustration, I think. I mean, basically, they did. They they did. Uh, right? They they did something that is. Uh, I think that they devised it based on this, right? Which is the uh, mm -hmm. kind of ground truth. But in principle, it's a graph. How how to visualize it? It's a good question. I think that they did it based on this. Yeah. Asaf, okay. What is the edu content? This, um, uh, the second feature. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Okay, maybe the previous slide I missed it. No, it doesn't say. It says, uh, ah, maybe DNA replication, DNA content. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you can look at the paper. I mean, nuclear area, I saw it in the previous slide. Okay, no? Yeah, nuclear area, you can see here. But if you oh, so, to so go to the previous slide, please. Maybe something that relates maybe to the crowding. No, no, it's not the local problem. Yeah, there are not so assurances that, uh, but uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't read this paper. I, I, I didn't read it this year. I mean, I, I did read this paper several times, but this year I, I took a slack to myself and I, because I, I remember most of the information. And anyway, in a data science of cell imaging course, when you need to know when you present the paper, but in, in principle, you know, I'm showing, you can go to the paper and say, it's easy, it's easy. we can find it in like two minutes. Okay. Yeah, so maybe it's DNA replica uh, replication, right? DNA content. So the second mar ground truth marker, marker is DNA replication. So I assume that the EDU content is that. Okay. So now validation. We have a method. It seems cool. It seems uh, that it makes sense. Now we need to validate it. And validating we can do with ground truth, which is again, you take the three ground truth measurements that are not used in the feature extraction. So feature extraction, you extract a lot of features related to the cell uh, appearance, right? Cell geometries and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, which, which also include the nuclear area, but, uh, but the, uh, other things as well. And, and definitely not the DNA content and the DNA publication. And in principle, uh, you would expect to see this pattern where uh, where uh, in different uh, cell cycles, so G1, S, and G2 are, are cell cycle stages, and you can see that uh, that uh, in principle you 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 see different uh, markers rising up in different uh, uh, stages of the process. So DNA replication is rising up at S, and the DNA content rises up at uh, G2. Yeah, a nuclear area as well. Okay, so now what we see here, and CCT is the, the cell cycle trajectory. So this is the measurement. So this is zero and this is one, right? And this is the trajectory. And this is what you are going to see in the x-axis. So the x-axis here is the uh, cell cycle trajectory. And uh, the y-axis- It's not cell cycle time and then the- Maybe time. I don't remember the the term that they use. How did they call it? Cell cycle. Maybe cell cycle. I think time. they don't call it. Hmm? No, they, they didn't mention. It's not mentioned here. Yeah, it's in the. But it's the same. Uh, but it, yeah, I mean, cell cycle. Pro probably it's cell cycle trajectory because I wrote it here after I did uh, after uh, I read the paper. So okay. I assume it's the cell cycle trajectory. Anyway, it's the measure, it's the readout, it's a, a, a scalar, it's one number that gives us uh, where we are along the, the trajectory. Uh, so, yeah, so now you can see this is like, uh, and now you can see in, 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 uh, in uh, red and in uh, green and in blue, you can see uh, in, in, in experiments how these values are changing over, over time, over, over the the CCT, right? The cell cycle trajectory. So you can see that the, 
DNA replication, which is, which is uh, supposed uh, theoretically is, is supposed to rise up at S, you can see here the data and you can see that it rises up at S. And the nuclear area and the DNA content, you can see that it rises up in, the, in G2, and you can also see the pattern, right? So this is a one uh, validation. We know what is expected. So of course, when creating the CCT, we didn't use any of these parameters. And now when, uh, well, cell, well, the nuclear area probably was used, uh, even if not the uh, other, other features are super, super correlated to that, but the rest are, that the others are not. And this gives us a, 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 at least some, some kind of, a, of, a, of a validation in the, the CCT is, a, is actually a reliable uh, measurement. And, and now what they did uh, also, they, they used a, a readout that are used as markers for the uh, cell cycle uh, stage, okay? Cyclin A that uh, rises at G2 and the P, C, and A which rises in S. And you can see again the patterns from the experimental data along the, C the CCT, which uh, which uh, means that uh, right that it makes sense. I mean, they took specific markers for a uh, cell cycle state, and then they could uh, they showed that it correlated with the states that they predicted based on the morphological features of the cell. Okay. And more validations. This is a very, very cool experiment, I think. They, uh, they, they arrested the cell cycle state, which means they, I mean, you have a lot of, you have, you have in your experiment, you have a lot of cells. Some of them are in a, are, are, are at the later stages and some of them at the earlier stages, right? They're not synchronized. What they did, they arrested the cell state, the cell cycle state, and then they, they released it. And in principle, what they did, now they start, uh, the cell cycle starts at the same point for all the cells. And now basically they can go through real time and see how their CTT, CCT changes over time. Because you start from the same position from the beginning of cell cycle, you would expect to see a trajectory that goes, and, and this is what they show here. So you see a distribution for each time. You see now that you start with the G1, then you turn to S, and then you gradually turn to the G2. These are the distributions, right? Can you follow? This is a really cool validation, I think. And then lastly, I mean, everything is fixed images, but now what they could also do is, uh, is, uh, is do, their, uh, do, do live imaging. So live imaging as they could do, but they did. They could, could, cannot use these markers that they had before. All of these, these markers are marker for fixed cells, right? That you, the cells are, you cannot live image them anymore. But what you can see here from live images and following something simple, simple as a, as a readout for a, for cell state along the cell cycle, uh, they looked at the normalized nuclear area correlated to the a local um, a local LCC is the local how did they call it local cell crowding. So again, and and the, as they found that local cell crowding is, is a very important parameter here. I think next slide I'm talking about it. So they 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 had to normalize for the local cell crowding in order to compare different cells because some cells are as they are in a less crowded environment and they are larger from the onset from the beginning and then they grow further and some are in more packed areas and then they are smaller and then they grow smaller, right? So if you want to put them on the same scale, you need to normalize by the, by the uh, local cell crowding. And basically what they show is again, that over time, uh, you can see that the cell cycle, that their prediction is that the cell cycle is, uh, is changing along with the parameter that, that is correlated to cell cycle, okay? So I really like their validations. I really think they are, they are powerful validations coming from different angles and trying to, to show that. I, I, like, I like this paper. All, I, I really like this paper, even without, you know, the whole thing. Uh, so I think the, the idea is cool using this uh, network thing. I think that the, the network, the idea of the network, and this is an idea that is important for, imported 
adapted from another field, I think it's cool. And I'm always looking out for other fields, looking for ideas and methods that we can adopt to, to cell biology. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, and I like the validations, which are coming from different angles and trying to show, yes, you can trust the CCT is, is a real measure for cell trajectory. It's very important when one introduces new measurements for something that, uh, that you validate that these measures are actually measuring what you are saying that they are. Okay, and now I alluded to it uh, briefly before, but now I want to refer to that explicitly. The microenvironment is important for accurate cell cycle trajectory. So uh, basically what you can see here on the right upper side, you can see a parameter for the local cell crowding, right? So this is, these, are, these are cells that are in a sparser area, right? Only you have few cells. And to the right here, you have cells that are all crowded and clumped, clumped together. And here on the y-axis, a, a marker of the nuclear area. And you can see that it's correlated. I mean, one, and even, even if you look at the same uh, state of the cell cycle, based on, based on, uh, you know, on, on markers for that, for example, you have these markers, right? For the different uh, stages of the cell cycle, you can see that there are, you can see that there are very uh, different uh, patterns here. Uh, uh, that as the local cell crowding grows, the nuclear area is becoming more uh, smaller in the different uh, in the different um, uh, in the different uh, yeah local local cell crowding. So, so for example, if you look here at one and a two, these are cells that their nuclear area is the same or very similar, right? But the two is in a much more advanced state of cell cycle compared to one. And you can uh, make this conclusion because it comes from a, a, a it comes and, and it, it, it's in a mark, the, the, the cell size is the same, but uh, but the, the, the state the stage is different, and 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 you need to correct for the local cell crowding in order to be able to evaluate that at least uh, based on the nuclear area, okay? Because otherwise you're, you can be confused. Say hey. The size of the cell looks as if it is in a, a G1, but when you look at context, at what happens in the environment, you can actually realize, hey, okay, the size is the same, but the environment is much crowder, so it means that it's actually in a more advanced stage. This is uh, important. You can see a specific, you can see the example, and a specific example here, when you can see one region, and this is the local cell crowding. So you can see the color code here. Red is very crowded, and uh, blue, bluish, cyan, or green is less crowded. And you can see here the nuclear, and you can see that here it's more crowded than here. And uh, when you look at the, as those are at the same size, you can look at the cell cycle, and here the prediction is that it's in G1, and here the prediction is in uh, F. Okay? So here, you can see a, a re relation between different the parameters and you need to take them into consideration if you want to make sure that you are making the right call. I mean, here's the local cell crowding, which is negatively correlated to the nuclear area and to other parameters, okay? So what they did, he, what they, did they corrected for the local cell crowding and they showed that uh, and they showed that it's really helping in the in, in getting our confidence within this uh, metric within this measure of the of the uh, uh, CCT. So you can see here uh, the nuclear area, for example, uh, uncorrected nuclear area. In they had two experiments with uh, with uh, less dense and more dense uh, cells seeding. Okay, so this was controlled. On purpose, they, made, they did an experiment that is more dense and an experiment that is less dense. And then they correlated, uh, and then they showed that uh, one, these different experiments, they look very different in terms of the, of the, of the, of the cell division state. I mean, here you can see that the early G1 in the low uh, local crowding area is very similar in terms of the nuclear size 
to, uh, to lay G1 states in the high uh, local cell uh, crowding uh, uh, experiment, right? So I think this is, uh, this is very nice. And once they correct for that, they get the measurements that are quite similar to one another. And this also helps uh, when, we, when you do the, the, when you build your, net, your network, when you take that into consideration, because otherwise uh, the, the similarity between two cells could be biased by this parameter, for example, by this type of parameters, right? So you have two cells that might be close to one another in the high dimensional space because they are similar in size. But one of them is much advanced than the other because, the, because there is a context of the local cell crowding. And they showed that correcting for that brings a better, better generalization in, in, in defining the, this uh, readout. <coughs> okay, so here they can show that there is a lot of variability in the cell cycle progression uh, in unsynchronous cell culture. So when you let the, the cells, you know, just uh, do whatever they want, that you, you get an unsynchronized culture and you can start measuring that. And, and look at also here, you can look at different readouts and you can see that uh, uh, here, this is a, a 0 0.6 specificity and here it's about one. And you can see that the different uh, uh, markers are, uh, are, uh, are picking. Uh, here it's an earlier stage than the markers that, that appear here. And they did the extra step of, uh, of uh, linking what, where, where the, the variability in the data comes from and how much of it is related to the CCT. For example, cell size is not related to the CCT, right? I mean, this is what we just said. It's, it's not, I mean, it has a, at least some com component that is not related to the, C to the CCT. So the actually device measures on how to, how to, how much of what they have in the CCT is, 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 is explaining the variability within the data, which you can see a lot of it. Like I told you, when people do take snapshots of a, of a, of a single cell RNA, they do PCA, the most of the variability comes, they encodes time a lot of the, many, in many occasions. Okay, so here they show it quantitatively. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and, 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 and they showed, and I, I'm not going to go into it. This is the figure, the last figure. They showed that uh, if they take into account the other sorts of cell to cell variability, they can, they can understand the new things about the cell cycle. And I'm not going to talk about it. And one of the reasons is that, the, I mean, I decided not to talk about it last year when I prepared this slide. And now I cannot talk about it because I didn't read the paper before the class, so I don't remember. Okay, and I think now we are uh, framed to our uh, student lecture for today. Uh, so uh, Hila and Sa'ar, I need to give you access. Oh. Ah, Hila is sharing, but you want to yeah. share too? Or you need... Okay, anyway, you are a co-host as well. Just a second. Welcome, Gil, and uh, Toda for coming from uh, Miluim. To hear me, I'm I'm flattered. <laughs> okay, il a voilà. Yes. Okay. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Sar, and with me is Ila, and today we are going to talk about. Uh, deep cycle, which is a framework for uh, reconstructing a cyclic cell cycle trajectory from unsegmented cell images uh, using CNN. So first let's talk about what is a cell cycle. A uh, cell cycle describes the process and different phases of the cell from its genesis to division, which is called the uh, cytokinesis. And uh, the image here describes the different phases um, which are G1, S, and G2, as well as the final phase M in which the cell uh, divides. Um, so how is it related to our course? Um, this article is yet, is yet another example of uh, in silico labeling, uh, trying to predict the fluorescence label, uh, labels from unlabeled live images. Uh, it also suggests an interesting method for 
inspe inspecting dynamic processes uh, that change along time series. Um, during the last hour, <laughs> I've presented two previous uh, works uh, for inferring cell cycle phases using fixed cultures and uh, flow through microscopy. Uh, these works have some limitations. Uh, first, they had strong requirements such as cell fixation, segmentation, and the usage of high resolution microscopy uh, with multi multiple channels. Uh, in addition, they failed to create a cyclic trajectory um, since the since they both uh, uh, interrupted by the phase M when the cell divides. Uh, you might be wondering, why is it so hard to infer this cycle and why do we need the uh, deep learning for that? Uh, so inferring the, the, the cell cycle uh, trajectory is, is pretty hard because cells may act uh, uh, differently during the, the cycle in terms of shape, size, and pace. And we could, we could see it uh, in the previous slides uh, according to the multiple uh, um, features of the cell, um, the variability of the features. Uh, moreover, uh, cells may get stuck in the middle of the cycle and uh, start an apoptosis, when, uh, which is when a cell decides to, to die. So as said before, the objective here is to create a framework for uh, predicting the current phase of a cell. Uh, give it, given its unsegmented uh, bright field images and the uh, hooks images, which is uh, the nuclear marker. Um, Deep Cycle does this by transforming the two-channel uh, image to a latent vector, then projecting the vector onto a two-dimensional space, and from that inferring the, the cell phase. Uh, we just want to stress out that although they stated and even bragged that they use uh, unsegmented images, the fact is that there is an automatic, automatic uh, uh, tracking step uh, during the pre-processing, which acts as a simple uh, uh, segmentation tool. Uh, in our article, they used uh, uh, the Fuji 2 system, which is a biological uh, uh, system with no uh, computation involved. Uh, it is a set of fluorescent probes that uh, enables the visualization of cell cycle progression in uh, living cells. And uh, in this method, we track the uh, co-expression of two proteins, geminin and CDT1, uh, which involved in the cell cycle process. To better understand the Fuji 2 system, you can see in the following video, uh, the two markers during the cell cycle. Um, we, just want to to, we just want to note that uh, this video is only an example uh, for the system and it's not directly related to the paper itself. Uh, the bottom image illustrates the different phases where during uh, phase G1, CDT1 is overexpressed and the cells are colored in red. Uh, then starting phase S, there is a transition between the expression of CDT1 and uh, the geminin. And there is a period of time where both are expressed, which translates to a yellowish uh, signal. And lastly, during phase S, G2 and M, uh, geminin is overexpressed. The uh, cells are colored in green and until the mitosis uh, takes place and two daughter cells uh, are formed. So they generated the data by performing time-lapse imaging of the cells for 33 hours in four different channels using the Fuji2 marker. Uh, the first two are bright finding hooks. Uh, which were used as the input of the model. And here you can see it in the first row. And the last are Gemini and CDT1, which were used to create the ground truth images uh, for the model training. And respectively, it's here in the last row. Uh, in total, they produced 2.6 million single cell images. And then uh, for training, they, manu they manually selected 1,000 uh, cell tracks that add a single cytokinesis event. Uh, that means tracks with partial cycle. In order to train the model, and since the images are unlabeled, they defined four virtual classes, um, which were the target of the model. This virtual class is based on the Fuji2 marker fluorescence and represents cell images with different combination of geminin and CDT1 intensities. Uh, each class was designed to have similar number of images. And for example, the blue class here uh, represents cells with high, co high intensity of geminin and low intensity of CDT1. It's important to note that uh, these classes do not approximate cell cycle uh, phases, 
G1 and S, etc., but uh, rather provide discrete labels uh, which derived from the Fuji2 intensities. To sum up, uh, during the training, the deep cycle model tries to predict for each image uh, the virtual class it belongs to and validates the prediction with the actual CDT1 and Gemini in, uh, intensities. The model they trained on top of the data uh, was a CNN that takes a two channel uh, image as an input, the OOX and the bright field. Uh, the input was fed to a four convolutional layer uh, of pre trained ResNet 34 and then goes to a fully connected layer and a soft box. The output of the fully connected layer um, represents a latent vector with four dimensions, uh, which is used for UMAP visualization and uh, that we will talk about it later on. And uh, lastly, softmax uh, generated the probabilities of a cell to belong to one of the four virtual classes they defined. Um, these virtual classes were used only during the training part, and the whole purpose was enabling the model to learn the latent representation of the images, which uh, contains the information from the Fuji2. We mentioned before the UMAP visualization that produced after the fully connected layer. So the UMAP is an unsupervised visualization approach for dimensionality reduction, also as the SAF present before. Uh, this, they use this for uh, representing the cells with similar deep cycle features um, in a closed and almost cyclic structure. They apply the UMAP algorithm on four dimensional features vector and map the cell images uh, into two-dimensional uh, cloud of points uh, of individual cells. And the UNMAP uh, results are consistent with the fact that CDT1, the red, accumulates in G1, and the geminine in green accumulates in uh, phases S, G2, and M. Uh, we will just note that, in our opinion, um, it seems that they tuned the hyperparameters of the UMAP and the number of the virtual classes uh, in order to get the circular and the closed uh, shape they got. To further investigate uh, how the Fuji2 fluorescence intensities change along the closed trajectory, they defined also the deep cycle pseudotime, um, which is the blue line, as the inferred progression of the cell trajectory from beginning to end. In order to achieve this trajectory, they cl clustered the data points by applying SOM self-organizing map on the UMAP space. And this created a one-dimensional projection uh, with circular structure that represents the general pseudotime. Uh, each cluster, which is the, each of the color, um, is a phase in the cycle. And that was the way they divided the trajectory to present of the progression from zero to 100. Following the previous uh, figure, here the x-axis is the pseudotime, and the y-axis represents the normalized average intensities of the CDT1 and the geminin along the pseudotime. And this aligns with the fluorescent trends of the Fuji2 system. And for example, in the around 60% of the progression, we can see decrease in CDT1 and increase in geminin. And respectively, in the Fuji2 psyche illustration, this is approximately the point uh, that S began, begins and the cell appears in yellow. This provides quantified evidence uh, of the deep cycle ability to organize the cells along their cell cycle progression. So in order to validate uh, the deep cycle pseudotime against the real cell cycle time, they manually selected 50 cells that have been tracked for over an entire cell cycle and unseen during the training phase. Uh, we can see that the cells images above uh, arranged along their uh, real cell cycle time from its first cytokinesis to the second one. Uh, this denotes the real cell cycle progression, which is the x-axis. <clears throat> for each cell, they inferred uh, its pseudo time by applying the trained model on it. Then they got a sequence of cluster indices, which represents the uh, cycle inferred progression. And this is described by, uh, by the y-axis. Uh, we can notice that despite local mistakes in pseudotime progression, the overall trend of both uh, cell cycle and pseudotime is the same. And indeed, they are uh, highly correlated. Uh, summing it all up, 
uh, we will present few strengths and limitations of the deep cycle model. First, uh, it overcomes limitation of previous studies, for instance, the two studies we saw earlier, uh, by providing a continuous closed cell cycle trajectory, which is not interrupted by the M phase when, a, when the cell divides. Uh, second, it's worth mentioning uh, that leaning on a biological marker uh, of the cell cycle in the way they did uh, was a novel approach in the field. Uh, that provided the model with relevant information regarding the, the cell cycle process. Uh, lastly, it, over, it offers an off-the-shelf product which is ready to use on other uh, use cases. Uh, that being said, the evaluation was performed only on 50 cells in contrast to the training that used the 1,000 uh, cell tracks. Uh, and finally, in our opinion, this model may not be generalized to um, uh, other cases because uh, first they used uh, only one, one type of cell line, uh, both for the training and the evaluation. Uh, and second, it seems that the model is very sensitive uh, to its hyperparameters, uh, such as the number of virtual classes and the Yuma hyperparameters uh, they used. Questions? Any question? Okay, so I, I had a few questions that I asked you, and now you probably know the results when you presented to me before, and you know the answer. Um, so one was about the partitioning to training and testing, and second is the question about whether about whether it would be sensitive to multiple rounds of, uh, of applying uh, this, uh, this uh, well, I don't remember. You must be the stochastic algorithm, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's stochastic. And after our conversation, I looked it up uh, a little bit. Uh, and I found some posts that uh, said that even though uh, it is a stochastic method, method um, Usually, you will get the same results or similar results, uh, even when you apply it uh, multiple times on the same data set. Well, I, I would... Uh, anyway, I, I think that what they did here uh, um, is... Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they overfitted the data so it's kind of... Uh, so they get the cycle, right? I mean, they didn't, they didn't optimize Wait. anything. anything. What? We said it. Uh, we said we said it uh, during the the, uh, the talk that uh, ah, they no, they tuned okay. they tuned the hyperparameters to get a circular and continuous shape or kind yeah. of uh, uh, circular shape uh, by using. Yes, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I want to stress that. I mean, the main, I mean the the work that I showed you before. Okay, so they use the live imaging, the Fuji marker which is okay, which is a nice system of uh, live imaging and gives you better ground truth, right? But in principle, the novelty uh, comes from the saying, okay, we, if we have a circular process, we are uh, modeling it in, in, in a circular way, in a, in, a, in a measure that is actually, right? That, that yeah. is a, there is a better word for that. I'm not sure, uh, I, I forgot the word, but anyway, this is circular, right? Uh, but but in the optimization, they didn't do anything explicit to explicitly uh, uh, get a circular uh, state. Basically, they tuned their parameters until they got something circular, right? So yep. And, exactly. and, and if you think about it, so in cell cycle, okay, the other okay, I, I'm not sure if it's how robust it is or not. I mean, the validations are not as uh, convincing as the previous papers they showed you. Uh, and where, where, the question is whether the same idea could generalize to other processes that are circular in nature. First, I'm not sure if there are many uh, processes like that in cell biology. And Actually, we, in our opinion, it's maybe we can generalize it even to other type of cells in the same process in the cell cycle. Yeah, but so still for cell cycle. other, yes, for so for other process. I don't know. I don't think. Yeah, right. So I'm thinking when I'm thinking of an impactful paper, right? The paper that will make a difference, which is what I'm trying to show you in class mm -hmm. most of the time, uh, is uh, I mean, and, and yeah, the papers that I'm listing on the for you to pick 
some of them I didn't read, some of them I think are important, some of them I'm not sure, and I'm taking this to learn myself, right? But uh, but if you think why this, so last week, for example, we had a paper that uh, I think the novelty came from, okay, this is the first step towards combining in silico labeling and, um, and the screening, right? Okay, this is a statement. I'm, I'm saying, okay, they could do one thing better, another thing better, but, but it's very clear what is the contribution to the field. Here, I'm having a harder time to, 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 to get a clear contribution because, okay, we have already people who try to measure the cell cycle. Using neural networks, okay, also other people try to do something similar, not as good, but, but fine. Yeah, but the previous works. Are, yeah, that's it. The, the previous works uh, resulted with a linear trajectory. Uh, right. And this is the first one that uh, uh, comes up with the idea of the circular shape. But yeah, <laughs> it I, comes so with... I, uh, agree. I, mean, I mean, this would be a, a good argument. The circular measurement, which is now more resembling the true process, would make us... Would, 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 is a strong point. But the implementation, the, the things that you did, I mean, I would, if I would want to say that, I would try to to define an optimization process that brings that into consideration, right? The explicitly, that yep. defines explicitly that the cells are closer to one. Anyway, maybe, I don't know. Maybe I'm, this is my opinion. Uh, okay, so uh, now we are, uh, we are, thank you, Toda, Zayachla. And now we are uh, going to a 10 minute break. So we'll be back at the, uh, 16 past uh, Shalosh. Hello? I still can ask a question in the break. Yeah, sure. So, like you said, that you commented about the uh, hyperparameterization that did right to make it circular. So, does it, does, does it make the paper not as what it is stated, or does it like make it flimsy? No, I mean, they said everything that they did. I think the, the paper is, uh, you know, it, 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 it's okay. But it is, it's one of the first papers, right, to show circles. I mean, not, I mean, not many did it, like, not many did with using deep learning to make it circular. So. I mean, I, I mean, it's a personal opinion about the. Uh, I wonder what, no more. What, what, what makes a paper uh, important or less important? That's all I mean, or. I mean, what, I'm just giving you as, as students for, you know, graduate students, you're picking your project. You, are, you have multiple ways to advance. Maybe I should say this to the whole class. And the next time uh, someone will ask the question, it's uh, maybe not only interest for you, right? If, if we maybe ask it when we come back from, uh, from uh, recess, okay? Okay, so first uh, I got an email and I see also a message about, and also I got another email about the missing lecture in the Moodle. I don't know what's going on. The Moodle and the Zoom are doing the kind of arbitrary. They are moving things to trash. And to, I, I don't know what is going on there. Anyway, I created an uh, an outsourced uh, file with all the lectures. I'm not. I'm now going to send you all the links to all the lectures. I'm going to send it now in the chat box. And uh, if someone reminds me, I'll also put it in the Moodle. I wanted to do it now, but I I, I didn't have the time. It before coming back from recess, so so uh, all the links to all the lectures are supposed to be there. If something is missing and the Zoom does some crazy stuff sometimes, and then just ping me an email and I'll fix it. Um, okay. Uh, before we went to recess, uh, Samuel asked me about the contribution of the study and uh, circular and no circular. Why is it? And, and and the reasons that I'm giving you that I'm telling you my personal opinion and, and why I'm also asking you to, to, to say your personal opinion on papers is because I think it's very important as uh, researchers, as uh, you know, you're all here in a, in a research oriented degree, is to understand what is important and what is less important and what is worth pursuing and what is uh, not worth pursuing. In each of your, your master students, uh, there are a lot of, it's like, you know, it's like, uh, Roots. There are a lot of trajectories that you can take in your research, and you can pick a different project uh, throughout your uh, academic life, and also in industry, right? You can work on different uh, on different uh, features within the system or whatever. And I think it's very important to think before you do it, not just do it because you have an idea you find funding in 
and you want to 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 go through it but think if if it would work first you know if it would work would it be important would it be meaningful would people care about it and and and, and this is when i'm when i'm Taking projects for myself, or I'm proposing projects to students. I'm trying to select projects based on this criteria, uh, trying to to make an impact and to to bring something different to the field because you know because it's more interesting and more more you know more important. We want to do to 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 spend our time is very valuable, and we want to spend it on things that matter and not just on, on crap. Uh, okay. So now, after this uh, philosophical uh, message, uh, we can continue. Okay, so um, I still have some slides to go over screening, and I'm, I'm going to I'm going I'm going to finish it today. It's like a never-ending, right? Every time I'm tempted to do other things, and we never finish this uh, class. But we are going to finish it today. But what I want, uh, uh, hopefully. Uh, but what I do want to spend some time today and also uh, following a student to ask me to show about uh, some uh, uh, more than just the techniques or a way of thinking in research, et cetera, is I wanted to show some, uh, um, uh, to show you on some highlights of projects that are ongoing in the lab about uh, cell to cell communication. I think it's a, it's a cool concept. It's not related to most of the things that I showed you so far. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's 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 more trying to measure things that were never measured before, and trying to use them to learn something new about the process, about how the process works. So, so asking, trying to so tool building, but tool building for something that is not like a, a, another a, a noise reduction, right, the technique, or another mapping from one modality to another, which is basically the same idea applied to again and again and again, which is you know it's cool and it's important, but but. So I want to show you one example from uh, the research in the lab. And after we are done with that, and it's a very, a very broad, so it's very high level. If you'd like, uh, I, can, uh, I can zoom in to whatever you're interested in there. In this case, I'm very familiar with everything that is going there. Um, and then I'll go back to the screening. Uh, and I also have there some screen that uh, relates to my project that I was involved in. And uh, that uh, if we have time, I'll show you, and if not, I'll show you next time. Oops, okay. Okay, so I'm actually, I, I decided to take this opportunity also because uh, I'm also preparing a talk for next week for the Israeli uh, Israeli Society of Microscopy annual meeting. So it's uh, two, there are two, two reasons here. Okay, so information processing in multicellular systems. Uh, a lot of what, what I've shown you in this course is uh, looking at single cells, right? I mean, screening, we take measurements of single cells uh, or improving images in general. But, but when, we, when we look at the, when we look at the, how cells operate and how cells do stuff, usually uh, the, the function is not done at a single cell level. Cells are working together to, 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 toward a, a, a common outcome. Uh, for example, in developmental processes, right, cells are, 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 are creating organs, right? It's not one cell, but it's a group of cells that are together uh, 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 generating an organ. Um, in uh, in um, in disease, in cancer, for example, it was always told we were all, always told that it's one cell that is causing the damage, right? One cell that is leaving the primary tumor and, and ma making it, its way out, going into the bloodstream, surviving within the bloodstream, coming out somewhere else, and generating the 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 the, the, GUA, the, the metastasis. Uh, now there are more and more evidence that uh, when it is a group of cells, a small group of cells that is doing the same process, they're actually, it's actually more effective. And what is the reason for that? Is it because the group of cells are, you know, they're just holding uh, heads together and uh, trying to survive in this, uh, in this very challenging journey, right? To, to cause damage and to kill, a, to kill a person? Or maybe it's because 
each cell is taking a specialized role and, 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 and making calls together, making decisions together and, and, and making a, a group that is a, more than the, sum, than the sum of parts, right? And this is a question that we cannot ask right now because we don't have the, the tools to actually ask it systematically and quantitatively. So this is one, uh, one um, uh, arm of the lab. We have, we have two arms in the lab. So this is one of the arms in the lab working on trying to understand uh, information processing in multicellular system. And the approach is basically, if usually what, what, what the people do is take the, the whole uh, group of cells, measure something in the, in the, in the group scale, and then perturbing the system. So putting a drug or doing some manipulation on the cells, putting some stress on them, and then measuring again and seeing how it was affected from that understanding the collective behavior, our approach is, is, is different. It's actually opposite, it's bottom up. Instead of top, trying to understand what happens in the population level, and from that make an understanding of what's going on in the, in the single cell, uh, we are uh, trying to take an opposite approach of going from the single cells up. So the idea is to model a, a, a group of cells as a multicellular uh, network. So each cell is a, is a node, is a, yeah, is a node in the network. And there is an edge between, uh, between a, a pair of cells if they are uh, behaving similarly. In this, uh, in this case, or, or influencing each other. It depends on the application. But anyway, there is some relation between the two, um, between the two uh, cells that are also related, usually also related spatially. Uh, so specifically, and, and once we, we can do that, we can start follow how information, okay. So, and this is a network representation of cells. Not in all projects in the lab that we are going through that we are still, we're, we're already in this stage of the, of a, of defining explicitly a network, but uh, we are moving to it. In all the projects, we are moving to it to this direction. So the the basic idea is, if we can take now, and we're talking about live imaging, right? So we have dynamics. So if we're taking a time series of one cell and a time series of another cell, and from that we can define directional edges within this network, which we call uh, influence edges, basically. If one time series is predictive of the future of another, of another time series, we can say that cell I is influencing cell J. Uh, uh, more, more technically, the idea here is to build a model. So basically a model, you can think the simplest models are, a, are a, um, a regression, regression models, models that use a, a, the past of a time series to predict the future. So this is your baseline. And then if you go to the other cell and you include information from the past of the other cell and, and introduce it with the past of the present cell and your predictions improve, it means that the past of cell I includes information that is related to the future of cell J. So we could improve the model of, of, uh, of uh, predicting the future of cell J by including information of cell I. And this means that cell I is influencing cell J, okay? Let me give you a classic example. So there are several methods to do that. And we use a, a method called the Granger causality, which is basically a, a very old a, a method that uh, from uh, information theory that was used in a, a mathematical method that was used in uh, economics. So if cell I is the stock market in uh, New York and, stock market and, and, and time series J is the stock market of Hong Kong, if I can use information from New York to improve my prediction of the future of Hong Kong, I'm going to be very rich, right? Everybody are trying to predict based on Hong Kong and I'm going to show, hey, if I take information from somewhere else, then I can, be, I can, I can improve the prediction. So first I'll be very rich, but second, it also implies that, or at least suggests that New York is influencing a, a Hong Kong, right? So there is a directional edge in the, in the network. And this edge re represents flow of information. So our information flows from New York to Hong Kong. And this flow of information can go to one direction, can go to both direction. And when we look at this network and we're trying to model it bottom up from the single cell level to the collective uh, level, we can start seeing how information propagates within these networks. So these are the, this is the general idea. I mean, this is a big idea that uh, we're now trying 
to apply to different systems in the lab. And the idea is to, to, to develop a, a, a general a methodology for all the stages, but while doing so, also to come up with new discoveries on specific biological systems. So I'm going to briefly show you three biological systems that we are already have, uh, or on each of them, we have uh, at least one project that is, uh, that is already uh, published or in advanced stages of publication. In here, you can see preprinting. Uh, and since we are a pure computational lab, which is uh, very uncommon in uh, cell biology, uh, or trying to be cell biology, right? Uh, we are getting our data from uh, mostly from uh, collaborators. So on the left here, you can see uh, what you what you see here in uh, in uh, green. You see here three cells. The green are the cells that are embedded within a network, a, fibri a, a, a fibrous network. So it's kind of you can think about it as uh, there are a lot of uh, ropes, right? A lot of ropes up there, and the cell is within all this jungle of ropes. And what you can see, you can see it. So, so the red is the rope. And what you can see is that the, 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 the ropes are, are much more denser between the cells, which uh, suggests that the cells are actually pulling the ropes to talk to each other, right? So are pulling the ropes and they are actually communicating mechanically by doing that. And this is a joint uh, project with uh, Ayala Klesman from Tel Aviv University. And uh, the advantage of this system is that we can actually look at the, at the environment and use the environment to try to predict which cell is influencing and which cell, and which cells are communicating and how well they are communicating, et cetera. The second, uh, the second um, a project is related to collective cell death. What is collective cell death? So cell dying is a basic process in many biological processes, even in development when in principle, mostly an organ grows and there are more and more cells that are joining, still that are cells that are dying and they are, uh, it's regulated, right? The, 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 the number and the composition of the cells within a tissue is, is a very regulated process. And by the way, when the process is not regulated as it should, uh, this is one of the hallmarks of, uh, of uh, cancer, right? So misregulation of cell death and cell division is, is causing, uh, is, is one of the principles that goes behind the cancer. So, and, and, and collective cell death is, a, is, is, a, is modes of cell death that are actually are propagative. Propagative, so you can see here, what, so you can see one cell dies and then it convinces the cell around it to die. What is attractive about this system in terms of, you know, the general goal of uh, my lab is, uh, is that uh, if we would look at it as a network, it would be a, a tree. So there will be no cycles because once a cell dies, that's it, right? The game is over. So it goes, the flow of information usually goes into one direction. And this project is in collaboration with Mike Overholter from uh, Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center from New York. And the third project, which I'm going to spend uh, most of the time uh, in, this, uh, in this hour, is uh, a project that is led by uh, Amos Damir from the lab. And, uh, and uh, our collaborator is Bosan from Oregon State University. And this relates to collective synchronization. And the first two projects are more about at this point, we're still mostly measuring things. We're building tools to measure things that were not measured before. In the third project, I can tell you a full story about the process. So actually a more scientific process of how to use computational tools. And the ideas that I showed you here, I, I just, you know, I just hand waved here on how a system is synchronized. So very briefly, just to show you how these cells are communicating. So these are the two cells. And this is the band that is forming. So you see here a time-lapse movie. Here is the time up here. And you can see that uh, through time, the band is forming between the cells. Asaf Nahum, who graduated uh, last year, uh, he was the first uh, Meital student in, uh, in my lab. Uh, and again, this is a project with Ayala Lesman. He defined a way to quantitatively measure uh, how these cells are communicating. The idea was to characterize, so there is segmentation involved there and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, very careful analysis to make sure that uh, is not capturing things that are not relevant, but the, sim the you know, simplifying the idea is he looks at, uh, at, at regions close to the cells in 3D, and he measures the changes 
in the density, in the density of the of the fibers uh, within this region, and he is using this fluctuating time series as a signature, and he's just looking at correlation between those two time series, and this 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 this, this, this uh, correlation or of the of the of the of the time series is a measure for uh, uh, for how good these two cells are communicating. So basically correlating what happens near one cell to what happens near the other cell, okay? And if it is high, it means that the cells are communicating. So here are examples of cells, and the question is, can you match between the communicating patterns? So each of these are actually, they're cropped from movies like this, right? Where you have a pairs of cells. But the question is, I mean, based on that, it's very hard to say anything. And Asaf was able to actually define a unique signature for each pair of communicating cells. So in principle, if you give him images like that, he can tell you even without telling uh, uh, which is which, which is communicating with each, he can do with a very high, high accuracy, he can tell you these are the two cells that are talking with, with each other, and these are the two cells that are talking with each other, and et cetera. And okay, it's a, it's a fun game, but what it means is that, uh, that this measure is very sensitive. So we have a measure that is good to distinguish between different pairs of communicating cells, which means that it's a very sensitive measure. And now we can try to use it now to understand how communication is, is, is regulated. So what proteins are playing a role in communication, whether this type of communication is uh, correlated to metastatic in uh, cancer, whether, you know, all, all kinds of questions. So far, uh, we use the ASAP methodology to reveal a, a, a very basic uh, observation regarding that until now, the, the, the way to decide that cells were communicating was looking for this band. So if you can see or measure that there is a band, that there is a higher density between the cells, this means that the cell is communicating. Asaf was able to show that it's not necessary. He can, he can find communication signatures even when a band is, is, does not form, one. And, and we showed two experiments where our collaborator, uh, Ayelet, inhibited, inhibited is downregulated, the contractility, the kibbutz machinery within the cell. So contractility, the, the ability to contract is necessary for the cells to actually grab to the, to the fibers and actually pull, right? So even when most of the contractility is reduced, ASAP, can be, ASAP, is, ASAP method is able to find communication between the cells a unique signature. When you take all the contractility out of the cells or you kill contractility altogether, uh, it fails. It means the cells need contractility, but they are very sensitive. They can use even very little forces to actually communicate for the long range of mechanical uh, uh, interactions, which is pretty cool. So this is one example of building a tool and starting to, to learn new things about biology by using it. Question? The second project is the cell death. So here are the movies. Look how beautiful it is. I actually posted uh, this video on uh, Twitter and then it became viral. I think it's this one, maybe some another uh, video. And then it uh, became viral and uh, Wynet wrote about it and Israel Ayom and all of the papers that I was invited to. to... But it's pretty, so the images are, are, are pretty. The video is very cool, but also if you think what's going on here, it's really cool. So wh when you see something green pops out, this means this is basically a, a fluorescent marker that is uh, encapsulated within the nucleus of the cell. And when this form of cell death is, uh, is, uh, is formed, when the cell dies in the dying process, the nucleus uh, uh, ruptures and the fluorescent marker comes out. So when you see the when you see this green marker, it means that the cells, the cells are dying. And you can see now they're stopping moving also and that's it, they're dead. And what you see here very cool is that usually when people think about the cell death, they think, okay, we apply a stress on the cells. Stress, I mean, cancer cells, we put some treatment on them and all the cells are struggling. Oh no, I'm feeling the, the drug and they die, right? Each cell is, decides to die because they have an external stress. In this mode of cell stress, which is, which is called peroxosis, and it's a form of cell death that is induced by 
uh, uh, nanoparticle so by, by iron basically. Uh, רגיש למתכת, so, 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 so they get iron and then, then uh, some processes occur within the cell and then they die, the, the nuclear birth and they die. What is super cool about this process is that most of the cells are pretty, you know, they, they, they can suffer and they stay alive. And then the one wuss cell, right, the anaknik bechavura, is a weak cell, he decides to die. And once the cell dies, he can convince, he or she can convince uh, its neighbors, and then their neighbors are much more susceptible to die. So one cell dies, and then the cell next to it says, uh, and then he says, okay, partner, you should, uh, you know, he died in Chalamut, you should die as well, and then it propagates, and then you get a wave that is propagating along the population. Which is pretty, I think it's really cool. Right, look at that. This is a collaboration with uh, Mike Overholzer from Memorial Sloan Catering, and Michelle uh, did all the experiment and led this study. And uh, I think it's cool to show that uh, there were four students at the time, uh, graduate students that, that, uh, that contributed to the study. Hen is now a master student uh, in, the, in the department. So what we did in, 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 in the joint study, uh, we measured, we defined measures for this propagation. Basically, the idea is very, very simple. Uh, uh, we looked at, uh, at uh, the time distances. So it involves image analysis and it involves looking at the, time, at the distances between the closed cells, how much time uh, goes between one cell dying and the other cell dying and, and, and building statistics out of that. And then uh, uh, saying how would it be if, 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 the, if, you, if you perturb the cells, if you shuffle the cells partially, right? If you change the location partially and you do permutation tests, would you get a similar pattern? And the answer is of course not, but it gives you a measure for how well, uh, how, how propagative is, is this type of test. Yeshaya is taking this one step ahead and he's saying, okay, if a cell that is spreading in a population, there is also always two components. One is the cell autonomous, autonomy, so not dependent on any neighbors, a cell that decides to die without neighbor, neighbors telling it to die. And this was what we call nucleation. So it's like green, like a nucleus, a nucleation process that is then propagating. And, and the second component is the propagation. As the Shaya is building, at least the, the, is building tools, measurements to, to measure the nucleation, the propagation. And once we have both of them, we can start look at different forms of, of cells that can put them in the scale, more propagative, less propagative, uh, more nucleative, et cetera. And what uh, he discovered, which is uh, kind of obvious when you even look at the movies, but he can put numbers on that exactly, is that uh, uh, the cell that people usually talk about, apoptosis, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is much more nucleate related. So basically, again, the cells are all experiencing an external stress, telling them die, and each, each of them die individually. Is, they do not relate a lot on what their neighbors decide to do. While in ferroptosis, it's uh, the opposite. So the cell is propagating. Or if you think about it, uh, uh, if, if we understand exactly the mechanisms of each of these cell deaths and how to, how to induce them, how to control them, uh, we can start doing some kind of uh, fancy combination. For example, cells that are very uh, re uh, resistant to death, right? You, you, treat, you treat your your tumor, your, your cancer patient, you're treated uh, with, uh, with some drug. The drug works well, but some cells are, 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 uh, are resistant and they stay alive. And then, you know, a year later, you have a relapse, you have a, 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 you have a, a, a tumor again. So if we know to control that, and we, we, can, we can try to involve multiple mechanisms. Some of them are, are, are based on, you know, just use the bulk of the population and just kill it. And some of them could be trying to use the neighbor cells that are more susceptible to die to convince the other cells to die and to propagate within a population. Maybe it will be more effective. What they did, the, the Overhalter lab at New York, basically they, 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 they showed that when they induce ferroptosis in mice, they can shrink tumors. So there, there is some reason to think that it might be helpful for something, uh, but we are now trying, if we really want to control that and to understand that, 
first we need to have very good measurements and second now and, and and once we have the measurements we can start understanding what are the mechanisms for that how does it work so here are some uh, preliminary results you can see here two measurements the nucleation and the propagation and you can see the different uh, treatment different forms of cell death are located differently and there is a steep a steep uh, dip here at some point between deaths that are more uh, propagative to deaths that are more nucleative, but the, but the composition is not trivial at all. There is a complex uh, relationship to going down. Yeshaya trying to understand what's going on. Uh, and one of the ways to try to understand what's going on is using simulations. So what uh, you see here are agent-based simulations. So what we do here for each experiment, we create a twin simulation. Each uh, dot here is a cell, which is an agent in our simulation, and we define rules on, on how a cell will make a decision in our simulation. And then we take quantitative measurements, for example, what I showed you in the previous slide, the nucleation and the propagation, and other measurements, which I'm not going to go into. And we can look in the parameter space of the simulation and try to see how we can play with the parameters and match what happened in, the, in many experiments. And we have Many experiments for each one of them, we have a simulate, we can do uh, the matching simulations, the twin, twin simulation. And based on that, we can find what are the, how to balance the interplay between different parameters of the cell decision to die. And then we can go to the biologist and tell Mike, hey Mike, we think that, what are the molecules that are involved in this decision of the cell? And then we can start and be more targeted in how to proceed, okay? So again, if I think this is the last slide about this project, yeah. So again, if we think here, we are building tools to measure something that was not measured before. And then we want to use these tools to actually learn some new biology. And you can see this is, so far we didn't do anything fancy. It's very simple, but it's very powerful because this is a, a, a cell that is a, is a field of its own within cell biology, it's a huge field, but for reasons that I don't do not want to go into, I, I think I, I think I understand why it's a, a, the the tools are so behind. Uh, but for us, it's a huge opportunity because we, we can be the ones who are actually making the first step into this uh, domain and, and 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 making important discoveries. Okay, the third project is uh, is uh, looking at the calcium dynamics in mechanically stimulated monolith of endothelial cells. So endothelial cells are cells that are located at the, at the barrier of the blood vessels. So are, they are separating between the blood vessels and, and the outside, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and when blood flows within our vessels, the blood it not necessarily flows in the same, uh, in the same velocity, in the same, right? It, it changes, the blood flow changes over time. So, so and, 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 and the cells that are aligning the surface, need to be able to think for, I mean, each cell is an independent entity. It has its own machinery, it can make decisions, it can do whatever it wants on one hand. But on the other hand, we need the system to be synchronized. Now, when we start, uh, I don't know, jogging or something, right? And the blood flows uh, faster or sleep and uh, it flows slower. The mechanical stresses that the cells are experiencing because of the sheer stress that they, so, so think about it, you are, uh, something flows, above the cells or below the cells. And they're feeling that and, and the mechanics are changing and they need to synchronize themselves along the whole population to be able to cope with that. So uh, what Bosan, our collaborator, he's from Oregon State University. He has a super cool system. He can control, he can uh, place these cells in a dish and he can, he can control the flow above them. And so we can make a, a flow you know, a liquid flow above them faster or slower, and by that control the mechanical shear stress that the cells are experiencing, are feeling, okay? What you see here in the video is calcium signaling, which is, I'm not going to tell you, because I mean, it's a data science course, so it's a general, a general readout for the cell state. You can see, I mean, you can see it's uh, some are coming up and down, it's, fluctu it's fluctuating signal. But we use it uh, as a readout to understand how the cells are, 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 are coordinating their, their behavior, synchronizing their signaling of calcium along a population. 
So here is the experiment. The question is, can the, mul the multicellular network, so we are going to create here a network. And the question is, can it learn to adapt to changing a external, external stimuli? And here is the experiment, which I think is super cool from both hands. From both, from, uh, well, well, the Hebrew speaking understand, I, I find it all, every time that I call him Bo, I mean, it's kind of uh, weird, right? I mean, we're talking, he's my colleague, we're collaborating. And every time I don't know how to approach him, uh, Bo, Bo, uh, because in Hebrew, Bo is, uh, is uh, calm, right? So Bo, Bo, I don't know, I mean, it's kind of weird. Anyway, that's, that's uh, yeah. For me, it's every time it's weird to call him, but he doesn't know that, so don't share it with him the video. Uh, so anyway, what uh, Bo does, or his student actually, is applying shear stress, cyclic shear stress. So the cells are experiencing a, a shear stress that is changing over time. For you, it's the other way, right? It's just, it's changing over time. So it's up and down and up and down like a sinus, a sinus slide. And we want to see how the cells are synchronizing their calcium signaling according to this changing stress. So, uh, one thing, to, one way to measure the synchronization is to look at the distribution of the calcium signal across all the cells. So for each single cell, we have its calcium signal and we can go through time and then we can see how it changes. So this is what you see here. You can see here the derivative, the change in the calcium. The, the black is the, is, is, the, is the average. Which you can see, I mean, you can see the cycles here very clearly, right? It's very nice. And the green is the standard deviation between all the cells in an experiment. And what you can see here very clearly, that the cell starts with a very high standard deviation. And through time, it converges. So all the cells are starting to behave very similar to one another. The, the deviation between them is reduced through the cycles. Which, which, which hopefully implies that the, the cells are synchronizing themselves. Now it could be a cell, a, cell, a, cell, a cell autonomous decision that all the cells are just synchronizing to the external signal. I don't have the data here to show you, but when, we, uh, when our collaborator is inhibiting gap, gap junction, which is a molecule between the cells that, that is known to involve in this type of communication, the system does not synchronize. So you need this, it's not only that single cells are synchronizing the cells to something external, there is also a local communication between the cells that is necessary here for the synchronization. Okay, so how would we build the network? Uh, we are looking at the cells that are close to one another and uh, we are defining uh, the influence measure, whether to put an edge or not to put an edge based on what I told you before. If the time series of cell A is predictive of the future, is improving the model uh, based on just using the time series of, uh, of cell B uh, by itself, then we say that there is an edge from A to B, a directed edge and vice versa, okay? And now we build a network. And now what we can look within the network is say, so we also look at measures of network, but I, I want to, I, I don't want to go to it uh, right now. Uh, 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 what we what we can what I can uh, tell you is that we're looking at uh, for each cell we're defining two scores how good it is at uh, at uh, spreading information outside how good it is at influencing other cell and we call it call it the transmission score and 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 you know and and the definition is what is the probability of having an outgoing edge in in the local neighborhood of the cell. And the other measure is the receiver score, which is how, how good the cell is at uh, listening to other cells around it, being influenced by other cells, right? Okay. And now when we have two measures, we can start and look at the, at the cells. And for each cell, we have a transmission score and a, and a receiver score. And you can see here two things. One is you can see heterogeneity, shonut, right? Variability between the cells in these scores. So you can see that some cells, uh, cells are really bad at communicating, some are really good. And if you look over the cycles, you can see that it goes from lighter colors to darker colors in the blue and in the red, which implies 
that the, that the cells are becoming more and more communicative over time, right? There is more information that is going out of the cell. This is the transmission score. And there is more information that is coming into the cell. This is the receiver score. Which, which, which makes sense because the system is synchronizing and information is flowing better within this network. It becomes a network with more edges over time. Asaf? Yeah. For each uh, cell, I want to, understand, to see if I understood it. So for each cell in each cycle, you measure uh, if you can predict the next cycle, the value in the next cycle with its neighbors? No. Okay, no. so I misunderstood it. So, so these, these methods, uh, the, these methods of, uh, you build an autoregressive model. Let's say we want to assess the influence on A on B, okay? So you mm -hmm. build an autoregressive model on the time series of B, which basically means that uh, let me let me enjoy myself with uh, some uh, colors. Basically means that you are looking here at the past and you're predicting the next time point, right? You're looking yeah. at the past, and so you're building the model based on one time series, okay? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to go, you know, I can show you the math or, or you discuss the parameters there and what are, the, what are the assumptions and what you need. I mean, you need to, to see some properties of, of your time series, but it, oh, sorry. I just talked about the autoregressive. So the, this is the autoregressive model and the, the mod, so this is, let's call it model uh, B, right? And model A and model uh, BA, also takes information from the past of, uh, of A, I should probably use a different color, and takes, and what I have here, and what I have here, and tries to see if from both of them, we can improve the prediction of the next time point. And again, mm -hmm. doing that for all this data, uh, we can have a statistical test that will tell us whether we improved significantly or didn't improve significantly the, uh, the the model, the MB, right? The model that was uh, developed for B alone. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and the and the time series we do independently for each cycle. Okay. So I, I think I did understand it correctly. Maybe I didn't explain it. So for each uh, each of the cells, you you try to do it with each of its neighbors independently. Yeah. Okay, and you don't go as far as uh, going to the next neighbor, like only if they, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so, so I mean, okay, uh, so, so it's a detail that I didn't want to share, but uh, okay, we, we, uh, we are looking at the at neighborhood of two, mm -hmm. so topological distance of two, right? So neighbors and distance, uh, the first neighbor and the second neighbor, mm -hmm. the reason for that is that it's more stable in terms of defining this measurement because you have more neighbors and you can have more, uh, you, you have more data. If you go to three neighbors, it's already a stable measure. You're not going to see a change in the transmission or receiver score. And the variability is going to not change much. So we decided on two because it's, uh, it captures, you know, it's, it's, it's the best trade-off between uh, uh, being robust and being uh, minimal in terms of the local environment. Hello? Okay. But it's a, it's a good question. And we had to think a lot about how to define that. And you'll see at the end of, uh, of, of what I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm, we're going to look also at further distances. You'll see why. More questions? Okay, so you can see that uh, there is more, uh, we call it flow of information, information flow through time, and it correlates with the, with the reduction of the, um, a reduction of the synchronization, right? Of what you see here. Okay, that's nice. Let's take a, a zoom in, not just look at the, at the but try, try to look at the single cell and try to see whether some cells are more important than others in, in, in defining this synchronization, et cetera. What we decided is to take this two-dimensional space of transmission score and receiver score and define a uh, roles of the cells. Define for each cell, assign a role. What are roles? 
One role is individual. Individual are antipathy, antipathy. Yes, they don't have, they don't listen to anyone and they don't convince anyone, right? They are not influential and not influencing. Eh? So the probability of having outgoing gadgets and ingoing gadgets is very low. Then we have the common region, which is here is consistent distribution, right? But then we have the common region, which is where most, the bulk of the data is at. These are the normal cells. And then we have cells that are better at communicating. Some of them are leaders. They're better at transmitting information. Some of them are followers. They're better at receiving information. And some of them are what we call communication hubs. They are good at receiving information and at transmitting information, right? These are the coolest sets because they can do everything in the network, okay? And now once we have this uh, assignment, let's look how this uh, assignment changes over time. So you can see, I mean, basically there is nothing new here. In principle, you can see that you get more flow of information over time. You get more cells that are better at communication through time, okay? It's the same result basically that I showed you before, just in a, in a quantification. And along the, the reasons that I jump when you say you look at one cycle and then you correlate it to the next cycle or do something to the next cycle is exactly because what I'm going to show now. And what I'm going to show now is that the cells have memory. So they, where they have a role and they remember the, their roles in the communication network. So what you see here, we take the transmission score of a cell and we look at the next uh, uh, at the next cycle and we correlate the transmission score to the transmission score and the receiver score to the receiver score of all the cells. And what you can see, first, that the there is a correlation. It's a positive correlation. It's not zero. It's not negative correlation. There is a correlation. And what you can also see is that the correlation grows over cycle, which means that the cells have a memory of their previous, I mean, they can switch between roles. I mean, you see that the correlation is not one, it's not 0 0.9, it's at best it's 0 0.3, right? But but there is memory, it is consistent, it's a lot of data and a lot of cycles and, uh, and a lot and other experiments. So they have memory and they're, they're, over time, they're reinforcing the role in the communication network. So once a cell decided that it is a, a, a leader, in the next cycle, it has a higher probability of staying a leader and not turning into a different role, okay? If you think about it, it actually makes sense because at the beginning there is balagan, there is a mess. The cells do not know what's going on and each one is trying, you know, it's like a new school. You come to a new school, you're trying to understand who are the queen of the class and who is the best in basketball and et cetera, et cetera. And then slowly, and who is the smartest kid and who is the whatever, and then gradually you try, you, you start to understand your role and you have your role and then you cannot change it anymore. I mean, yeah, that's another story, but uh, yeah, in my, I, I have army bodies for uh, more than, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to say more than 20 years now for my uh, Maslul, right? And even ones of them that are now uh, CTOs and very important people in uh, other things, they, they are still the, it doesn't matter. They're still uh, the chuku, right? They're still the chikmuk because uh, because uh, 20 something years ago they were chikmuk, right? So, anyway, again, I'm going into different stories, but this is what happens in the cells. Once a cell is uh, becoming a chikmuk, uh, it stays a chikmuk. Okay, I need to cut this video and uh, send it to my to to chuku. Okay, uh, yeah, let's let's move on. So so it's pretty cool. Think about it, the, 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 the cells, these simple machines, they have a memory. Actually, it's less surprising when you know other things about cells, but I'm not going to tell you about it now. Uh, okay. So let's look over time and okay, it's good that they have memory, but we have specific roles that we assign for each of the cells. Let's look what happens to the distribution of the role. So what you can see here, and it, it is expected, the, the, the antipathic individual cells through time, they are reduced. There are less and less individual cells. Common also, and the, and the roles that are more communicative are becoming more and more uh, a common in the population. So you have more leaders, more followers, and more communication hubs through time, which also makes sense because information starts to flow within the system. More and more cells are, are starting to join the party and start talking to each other, and, and the systems become the more uh, 
more community. So there are more leaders, more followers, and more communication hubs. But communication hub is, is actually special if you, if you look at it, because, uh, because you can see the, the rise here is, is much higher than you would expect. Let's look at it in a different perspective. And uh, I'm going to show it in a perspective of transitioning between roles. So again, we're looking at memory. A cell is in a, diff in a specific state in one cycle. And then uh, we build the network in the next cycle. And we ask whether it's changed its state. So here are the transitions. So first, all of the cell phone net. So you have here the different roles. And first, you can see that there is a flow. The arrows in principle go from left to right from less communication to more communication, okay? Second, uh, what you see here, you can see self edges, right? What are the self edges? These are the memory. So I, I didn't tell you what I'm measuring here, but the measuring here is how much I am surprised uh, by what I found. So a self is, 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 is a communication hub, but in staying a communication hub, I'm surprised 2.4 uh, uh, in, in the factor of two, 0.4 more, so 240% more than I would expect randomly if they would switch randomly between states. Okay, so so uh, basically this means uh, all all these the self uh, edges means that there is memory, and you can see here very clearly that there is one memory that is uh, the best. So once the cells are becoming very communicative, they are going to stay. They are going to remain very communicative. And this is the main driver of how information flows within this system. And also you can see, yeah, there is much flow, enriched flow between the hub followers and leaders and between individual and common. And that is the enrichment in, in communication, okay? And let's look at another, uh, from another perspective at the uh, communication hub. And what you see here is what you would expect by looking at the, the definition of leader and follower. How you would expect from looking at the marginal probability of being a leader and being a follower, how much you would expect uh, to see communication hub. And what you see here, the step I didn't show you, but uh, I didn't show you what are the step experiments. I only showed you the cycle experiments. But in, in, in both of them, you can see that you are surprised, you are enriched. So you are above the line, which means that you have more communication you have, you, you get more communication hub than you would expect, which actually makes sense because of this memory component. So because whoever reaches the communication hub state is, is, is probably going to stay in this state, you are getting an enrichment. And this is kind of a positive feedback that enriches the cells that are good at communicating, at communication and improve the, the flow of information within the, within the network. Last result that I'm going to show you. Uh, I mean, I told you a story, right? I mean, I told you a story about cells that are uh, starts at the, where they are completely unsynchronized, and through time they they, they become better at communicating, and they, they and, and they start talk to each other, and then information flows within the network, and the system synchronizes. But if this is true, I would expect to see also a spatial component here. So I would expect to see. A transition between, so the hypothesis was that at the beginning, the cells are learning their local environment. And through time, they start to understand the bigger picture. Because why? Because there is a, a Elon Musk, right? It's a very influential cell. At the beginning, he convinces only its small neighbors, right, in the building. He didn't have money even to buy, to live in a house. He was in a building. Was, I don't know, really. I'm just saying. Yeah making up no story, but, uh, but uh, and, and he convinced his uh, local environment that uh, he has some, uh, some cool ideas and slowly it propagates and, and people told each other and then people learn to, to, to listen to, to Elon Musk, right? So, so we think that the same thing is, is happening here. How would we test that? So let's do exactly that. Start measuring a, a, a information flow in, in, in um, in, uh, in, in increasing radiuses, right? So at the beginning, we're looking at, uh, at closer regions and then at further and then at further and then at further. And we want to see how the, the relations between space and time changes through the synchronization process. So this is what we're going to do. We're going in each cycle, 
we're going to take topological distance, so topological distance of one are the close neighbors, and this topological distance of four, because in order to go from the red cell to this cell, we need to go four, one, two, three, four, right? The trajectory of four. And we're going to measure the, the, the transmission and the receiver score. And then on one hand, we have transmission and the receiver score. On the other hand, we have the topological distance, and we're going to measure the correlation between these two. So if the correlation is negative, it means that cells that are closer to one another, that, that cells are communicating better locally, right? And if it's the opposite, if it goes from, if it goes from, uh, uh, sorry, if it goes up, so the correlation is better at longer distances, it means that cells are listening more to cells that are further apart, okay? And now I'm going to show you this correlation. So the dot, the big dot that you see here are the correlations. So you see that we start from a negative correlation and through time, we get a positive correlation. First, I mean, even without understanding what's going on, I mean, it's beautiful data. I mean, I can't believe, I couldn't believe that it was so nice. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable that experimental data is so beautiful, it's so clean. You see this transition, amazing. Okay, now let's zoom in at what, what does it mean to have a negative correlation? cells that are clo closer to one another, topological distance that is close, you have a higher probability of getting an edge than cells that are further apart. A, a, a positive correlation, cells that are closer to one another have a lower probability of having an edge than cells that are further apart. What this means is at the beginning of the experiment, the cells are better at communicating locally. And at the end of the experiment, First, at the end of the experiment, you, you can see that the, everything goes up. So the cells are better at communicating, but they are better at communicating at further distances than even shorter distances. And this is kind of uh, confusing because you would still expect that I, I would be better communicating with my neighbors and then someone further apart. And this is a technical issue. The reason is that my, uh, with my neighbors, I'm already synchronized, right? I mean, uh, me and uh, I don't know, me and my neighbor, we are already, we do the same thing all the time, right? So the ability of, uh, of, 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 of Granger causality to find an influence here, it's going to be very small because, because we're, because the marginal, because the, the, the residual, sorry, residual, residual signal, I fresh, because, because there is not much more information to extract from it who is influencing who. Further apart, there is more variability between the time series and we can use that to actually extract. So it's not really that the cell is listening more to cells further apart, but uh, here's already synchronized and we cannot measure anymore the synchronization, the, the influence and cells that are further apart, we can. Saf. Yeah. But if they are really synchronized, then you would expect that they would be highly correlated. That, that if, if one is in uh, some sort of uh, condition, then the other one would also be in that condition. So you have high correlation. That, that's true. So here, here is the cross correlation on the left here. Okay. This is cross correlation of neighbor cells, but it's still, you can see, you can see that the correlation grows very nicely through time. Okay. So this is only neighbors. It's not looking at topological distance that are further apart. But the neighbors are, so at the beginning you see less correlation, at the end you see more correlation, right? And the yeah. dots are when you see for two, so the dots show that there is a local component here. Okay? It's not uh, random. I mean, you see also the, the, the general, it's very tricky here because once you get to, the, once you get to, to, once you get to this state here, the system is super synchronized already, right? I mean, it's really, it's super correlated. Everything is correlated to everything. So even if you mix the cell, you're going to get very nice correlation. So it's very hard to do the decoupling between what is local and what is global. In, in this case, when it's synchronized. And, and, and so the sweet spot is looking at the beginning of, of the experiment when the system is not synchronized in order to decouple what is local communication and what is something that is just already a whole, a, a global communication by the system. Actually, SAR, a, SAR, SAR project in the lab is actually he's experiencing a system where the system is already synchronized. And so he, he, we don't have this process because the system is already synchronized. And also 
the, the project that I proposed to you, it's a, it's a course project uh, looking at ERC signaling. Uh, it's also, it's a system that is already synchronized. Here we had the, the, the possibility to perturb the system mechanically and see how it becomes from an unsynchronized to a full synchronized state that could teach us about how a system, a cell system can synchronize. And I think that this is like, okay, so the, 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 the summary is uh, that I didn't talk to you about heterogeneity, but there is also a component, the, but there is also results that show that the, uh, the roles are, the, I did, I mean, a little bit about when I talked about the communication hub, this is heterogeneity within the system, but memory and information flow that together contribute to the collective information processing, to how to make a group of cell process information from the local to the global scale over time. And I think it's a good example. I mean, we use their tools uh, from information theory, a little bit machine learning, uh, uh, network analysis, uh, 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 right? And, 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 and the goal was we develop new measurements and we learn new biology, right? I mean, eventually I'm describing to you a process, how a biological process occurs. And this is what is so exciting here, that the tools that we're building are allowing us to learn something new about the world, right? I mean, how many computer scientists can say that? Uh, uh, that you learn something new about the world, about the world, about how the cells uh, do something together. For me, this is my motivation uh, uh, coming to work every morning or staying at home and doing work. Yeah, okay, this is uh, something else, uh, which I'm preparing for the talk on uh, Monday. Uh, okay. Questions, comments? Uh, Z score is something which you develop in house, right? What? Z score for like the, the Z score which you develop for receiver and transmitter? Where did you see a Z score here? Uh, before, like a couple of slides before. No, even more. Ah, here you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a normalization. It's just to put, put different experiments on the same scale. It's a, it's a normali it's normalization. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so let's go to a 10 minute break, uh, 426, and we'll have the last uh, hour talking about screening. What's up? אהההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההה
we're expecting that the phenotype in the screen is going to be similar. Uh, we talked about looking at heterogeneity, so whether we can find signatures that are not just the average of uh, the, the cell uh, uh, signature, the, the, cell, the cell features, the, the, all the cell features. And uh, we showed, I showed this paper that showed that uh, including more information about the population, uh, the population can help. And I think that there is more, more work that uh, can be done here. Sorry. They perform uh, better. And uh, what I'm, what I'm, uh, uh, what I'm, what I'm, what I want to show you today is a few more examples. So here is one example, uh, which uh, they took uh, uh, parental uh, cells from tumors, and they created clones. What is clone? You start with one cell, and you let it grow and proliferate, and then you create a whole population from the one cell. Okay, so this is clone. So they wanted to see how different clones relate to 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 uh, different uh, to metastatic properties. So what they did, they performed imaging and then they segmented the cell and then they extracted a uh, morphokinetic uh, features, 215 features uh, of a cell, which they represent in this type of plot of, uh, you know, each line here is a feature and how big are the, the values, the normalized values, as this is a representation of uh, one cell. And then they performed the dimensionality reduction and performed clustering in this uh, in this uh, lower dimensional space in the PCA space. And then after doing that, uh, as they they had you know they just did the simple uh, hierarchical clustering. They got uh, seven clusters, and uh, you can see the signature of each uh, of each uh, cluster. Of, of cell morphologies, right? So you have seven clusters and here are examples from the cluster and here is the, the, um, um, the representative, right? Or the mean, uh, the mean cell uh, morphology within a cluster. So this spans the morphologies of cells. Now, once we have uh, the morphologies of cells, we can start looking at populations and we talked about how to encode populations so we, start, we can encode populations by the distribution of the different modes of the different clusters. Each cluster we can call it mode or morphs, here they called it. And now we can look at the probability of the different modes as, as a signature of the population. So you can see that in this clone, you can see that there is enrichment in uh, one morph and in uh, the other clone, there is uh, enrichment in another, in a, another morph. Okay. And now, once you have this, uh, we can look at the at the at the clusters. So this is basically what what you can see here. I mean, we have for each uh, for each uh, treatment each treatment is a is a column here. For each treatment, we have a distribution, like you can see here. For each not treatment, here it's a um, sorry, it's not a treatment. It's it's a clone, right? So for each clone, we have a distribution of the morphs, which you can see here by each column. And they did clustering on that. So now they did clustering on the, not on the, on the morphologies, but on the treatments. And based on that, they, they characterized six different clusters of treatments. So these three treatments are similar to one another, and these uh, four treatments are relatively similar to one. You can see the patterns, right? Cluster number three, for example, you can see that it has high, uh, it has an enrichment in this cell more, and a, a, oh, sorry, a low a reduction in this cell more, and an enrichment in this cell more, for example. Okay? So you, you have your multiple rounds of uh, first characterizing, first characterizing the single cells, then characterizing a population, then each of the population, uh, then clustering populations. And now you can, for each population, you have, uh, for each uh, treatment, you have a, a, a signature cluster of, a, of, a, of a signature morphologies within it. And now what they did is correlate 
the different uh, uh, the different clusters here to um, things that relate to metastat to metastasis. So what you can see here, uh, you can see here in uh, the the in on the left, you can see the tumor weight, right? More weight it means a larger tumor, and on the right here you see a, a, a measure for effective metastat metastatic metastasis, which is basically the human the DNA uh, content in the lung of uh, probably it was mice. I don't remember. I think they put it into mice or something. And you can see that there is, a, you, you know, it's not one-to-one. -one. I mean, you can see clusters now number two. So each of them is cloned, right? So each of these dots, I, I want to remind you, is a single cell that uh, grow, growing a population from a single cell from a tumor, and then looking at the distribution of cell shape within this population, and based on that, doing clustering to decide if it's two or one or six. So here you can see that basically uh, it's not perfect, right? I mean, you can see here two that are in two and two, one of the two that are here, but in principle, you do see a non-random. So one and one, even though they're not Super close to one another, they are still closer than a random pair. Okay, and you see four and four are here together, and three and three here are here together, and sixes are here together. So, and these the tumor weight and the effective metastatic are measurements that, in principle, they they are independent from the cell shape, right? These are real measurements that we're taking from the mice. Okay, so it's pretty cool in terms that they correlated very nicely the cell shape. To the metastatic uh, potential of this uh, of this uh, tumor, and what you can see here is again you can see a, some another measurement for uh, metastatic, which is the number of uh, circulating tumor cells. So I told you that the metastatic uh, process requires the cells to go out from the main tumor and evade into the bloodstream and survive in the bloodstream. So the circulating tumor cells are these, right? Circulating, they're in the bloodstream. And when you measure uh, how many of them are in the bloodstream, it's a, it's a pretty good readout for how bad is the, is the metastatic, right? Because, and there are some companies today that are taking uh, blood and trying to measure uh, the, uh, the DNA from the circulating tumor cells as a predictive measure for what's the situation, how bad it is, right? And, or, or because you know metastatic, you you do not necessarily you don't know where to look for them. It's hard to find them. So this is a good measurement to to have a prediction on how hard it's uh, worth working or how how hard to treat it, etc. So you can see here again that it's pretty cool. First, you can see the the, the, the correlation is not very important. That means that the number of circulating tumor cells is really an important me a very correlative measure to the effective metastatic. Which is uh, here? It's uh, uh, how much uh, cancer you have in the lungs. But what is nice here is that you can see the groups together, which means again that the composition of heterogeneity in cell shape is a predictor of a potential how bad is the metastatic. Right? Pretty cool. I mean, cool people die, but uh, cool in terms of uh, ability to correlate a. a cell shape to actual actual human life. And, uh, and the follow-up, uh, the nice follow-up that they did, they correlated a morphology of the cells also to gene expression patterns, not perfect. So they took gene expression, which is again, a completely different readout. They did PCA and then they showed the class. Again, the classes are cell shape. And there is a relation between sh cell shape and uh, the variability within the gene, gene expression uh, landscape, which, okay, maybe it's not super surprising because the expression of gene is, again, eventually it, it, it is relevant for the cell shape, but, uh, but still, it's, I think it's nice. And then they could build this uh, cool map of, uh, of, uh, uh, of mapping the transcriptome, right? And the idea also, they created here, Again, clusters based on the on the uh, uh, gene expression. Then they get had this uh, kind of two bi bipartisan graph mapping. Well, well, it's not really. I mean, it's not it's not large, but 
still mapping between transcriptome to the, morpho to the morphology to the in vivo function. And again, the cell morpho morphology is closer to the function. And then you can start and look what are the distribution of the cell uh, shape that are correlated to a bad outcome in terms of the metastasis. Questions? Okay, I actually wasn't sure if to show this example or not uh, this year. I mean, it's a new paper, right? It's from last year. I, well, last year I brought it in last minute just before class, it came out and I, I was excited and wanted to read it and decided to show it. This year I was not sure, I was debating with myself, but now after I, I showed you, I think it's a cool paper. I mean, I, I'm happy that I showed you. Okay, uh, a fourth example, actually I showed you in the possible project. So this is a possible project. What you see here is the ERC screen. So I told you that the temporal information is important for, uh, I mean, going into screens that include temporal information, it could be a, a cool extension. So this is what you see here. You see your different treatments and you see, like I showed you in the calcium signaling in my, pro, in Amos's project uh, uh, last hour, what you see here is something similar, just a different uh, molecule, which is a different protein, which is called ERK. And it's a very important, uh, it, it's in, involved in a lot of processes. So what they did here, they took the, the time series, the signaling of each. So for each single cell, they measured the ERK dynamics and extracted the time series. And then they performed drug perturbation and they wanted to see how the signaling dynamics change uh, in response to the perturbation, okay? And again, they have your population. So they take a cell, they measure the they measure the ERK, so they they segment nuclei, they measure nuclear uh, ERK uh, KTR BFP, which is a readout for the ERK activity, and then what they do, they find peaks in this time series, and they measure several they define several engineered can manually engineer the uh, uh, readouts uh, uh, that represent now the time series. And then what they do the screen. So they take the 394 well plates, take their compound library. So each compound is a, is a drug, put it on the cell image and they extract the, 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 the activity. And then they, they have these four features. So the four features are time on, time that the peak is going on, uh, the prominence, so the magnitude of the activity, the frequency, so what is the time between peaks, and the activity offset, so how far it goes from the from the bottom. And uh, they added also features for density because it seems that density was again a, a confounding factor. Like I showed you in the in uh, the CCT in the cell cycle, density is also changing the ERK dynamic. So they find that they need to normalize for that. And also the displacement, so the motions of the cells, which they didn't find any correlation between motion and energy. So this is their screen. And what they found, they have their here, here are the four measurements. Here are the compounds. DMSO is controlled. And they have your Z-scores, which is how much you deviate from control. And then they define, okay, when you have this score uh, above, two or below 0 0.2, which means that you got an activity that is a two standard deviation above or below what you would expect, which basically implies the probability for that in, in control is less than 5% in, in, based on the assumption of a normal distribution. What they got here is a bunch of hits. So they have here a bunch of hits and now they can follow up on the hits. So what did they, did they do? So these are the controls, what you see here in, uh, in, uh, in gray. And then they clustered their different hits. Hits are different than controls. And they clustered them into three classes, class one, class two, class three. And they characterize the, the common pattern within each class. So again, each, each dot here is a well with many, many cells. For each cell, they have the time series, the features, and they look at the average the average features across the population as their readout. 
And now when you look at the average uh, readout in class one, it's uh, patterns that look like this. Class two is in, so basically class one is uh, no activity, right? It's kind of, kind of looks uh, kind of boring. The DMSO, the control is, you see this, uh, this uh, oscillation. Class two, you see uh, again oscillations, but in, I think in lower frequency and in higher magnitude. And in class three, you can see a higher frequency of uh, oscillation. Huh? And what they did, so this is how they started the paper. And from that on, they picked on, I don't remember which class or which perturbation, something, an interesting perturbation. And they followed that up, up, up on that. So they tried to look for interesting, uh, uh, for, for they tried to understand what did this perturbation do. And then they build a model for that. I mean, they talk what, what's going on there. So this is that, that I told you this, I, I talked about this data in the, in the context of cell to cell communication. Now you understand a little more after I, 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 I showed you um, uh, last time I, what I showed you. Uh, but uh, yeah, in principle, uh, uh, including also the spatial relations and not only the single cell measurements. And there is a good reason biologically also to think that there will be spatial uh, relations here because ERC, uh, there are a lot of a lot of work on ERC uh, waves. So so ERC going from one cell to another, and uh, the involvement of ERC in collective cell behavior and uh, stuff like that. So and we already have preliminary results which are pretty cool in that, like I showed you last week. Okay, additional uh, screening data sets for your research project. So if you if you want, I mean, I showed you three projects with three data sets that. Uh, that they come from the lab. I mean, that nothing comes from the lab. I mean, we don't do any experiment, but uh, the people in the lab work on, and uh, that there is a lot to do, a lot to do, and you can you can be very creative there. Uh, there are other data sets that you can take and explore. Uh, the image uh, image data resource has many many experiments. I'm going to talk about it uh, in one of the next classes uh, about this uh, repository. Uh, and the other type of data, the, this RNAi screen for OGTPAs regulators and blah, 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 is, is a data set that is in the IDR and it's screening data. Uh, this uh, Pisa Galli et al is a tracking data set. So you have trajectories of cells and you can use the trajectories as time series and try to look at different uh, measurements that relate to time series. Uh, here in the Brenda Andrews lab resources, you can find other screening data. Uh, basically, their model system. This is a lab in Toronto, and they have they did a lot of screen. And they are on uh, Shmarim, on uh, on uh, uh, oh man, yes. 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 exactly yes. 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 On, on, on simple cells, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, but they have also a lot of uh, data there. Uh, there is the Human Protein Atlas and the Ellen Institute of Cell Science which are all kind of atlases that provide a lot of data. Uh, I will tell you about it, uh, but more toward the end of the semester uh, when I talk about the uh, atlases and public data sets, et cetera, et cetera. Question. Okay. So uh, I want to talk to you uh, about the, um, is about a, a project, a screening project that I am involved in. I was involved in, sorry. Uh, and it's not a single cell, it's a collective behavior screen. So we wanted to understand how cells behave collectively as a group uh, under different uh, perturbations, different conditions. Um, okay, again, it's my project. I'm biased here. I think it's great. Uh, and I, but but I'm going I am going to use this project also as a as an example of I am going to without describing the specific molecule I am going to give you some intuition on how this because until now we say perturbation when we don't care anymore I'm going to show you when we go to a specific project of screening and we really it's not just a methodology we want to really understand something about the biology and uh, how do we go upon it. Okay, so let's start. I will not finish it today, but uh, I'll start. So the idea is to 
try to understand, again, I'm interested in communication. This, this project was published already in 2017. I was already in, in, interested in communication, cell communications there. Uh, and the idea was uh, to understand the uh, long range communication between cells when they migrate collectively. So the question, the research question is when one cell knows where it is supposed to go, how this information propagates to other cell in the group. So uh, for example, if we have uh, an open space here and the cells are all packed here and suddenly we open the door, you can think of a very unpleasant situation uh, like this happened uh, not, not so far ago that something like this happened, right? Everybody was squeezed and something opened. And so, so, so uh, why, and, and then some cells know where they are supposed to go. Cells in the back have no way to know where, where what opened where, right? And the question, uh, but, the, but the question is, how this information propagates to the back? Is it like a simple process where, like a, 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 a Ramzor, no? Uh, Ramzor. In, this, in, the, in the streets when you, when you drive and you have the... Huh? A stoplight? Stoplight, Nahon. When you have a stoplight that turns green, and then the cell from the back, they or in the pack, right? Uh, from the traffic jam in the back, they have no idea what's going on. And only when a cell before them is going to free some space, a car before them is going to free some space, they are going to fill it up. So this is one possible explanation. But as I'm going to show you, in cells, everything is much more complex. It's much more exciting and complex than such a simple explanation. So the idea is to, we wanted to to do to, to create an experiment that uh, that resembles this uh, setting, where the cells in the front know where they are supposed to go, no, are, are aware of the free space. Cells at the back are not aware, and try to see how this information propagates from the front to the back. Actually, I'm also going to show to show you sideways propagation, not now, but in in one other class in a, in a different context. So here is the experiment. This is a monolayer of cell, monolayer, which means one layer of cells that are densely packed. And then you do an experiment, which is called a scratch, a wounding assay or a scratch assay, where you take a pipette and you, you create an artificial scratch. And when you do that, when the experimentalists do that, the cells at the front, they suddenly feel a free space and they can move. And cells at the back do not. And then we can use the beginning of the experiment when the cells at the back are still not aware what's going on to study information propagation. I can tell you a, a, a secret that I, 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 I definitely told you at some point that how I turned into cell biology uh, from a computer science a PhD student in a computer vision lab to a cell biologist. I bumped into a cell biologist to did experiments and he showed me cool movies and I showed cool patterns and I didn't know how they quantified it and they didn't quantify it in a very so it was one of these experiments. So I saw one of these wound healing experiments. And when I asked the biologist, okay, what do you quantify here? Basically, they told me, uh, I'll show you next slide, but look at it. I mean, look, look, look inside the bulk, look inside. I mean, it's so, there is so complex uh, patterns of motion that are going on here. It can't be just something trivial. It's, uh, you need to measure something more than just something trivial. There is a lot of things that are hidden here. So this is, Thanks to this type of experiment, I'm, I'm here today. And what usually people do, either they take a start point and an end point. So they say, okay, the area here is now, you know, less than what it was here and measure that. And then they do different, uh, different uh, uh, treatments. And they say, okay, treatment A is better at uh, my migration than treatment B or the other way around, the slope in this case. Yeah, treatment B is better than treatment A. You can either take snapshots of the beginning and, and the end, or you can take time-lapse imaging, so video, and see the process and then see that, okay, B is, uh, the wound is healing faster in B than in A, okay? Treatment B than in treatment A. So this is the standard way to approach that. And if you look at what is called the wound healing, so uh, how much, the monolayer advances over time. So basically following this, right? Following the, the, how much the area is gone over time. You see something very, very boring, right? This is something that is practically linear. You agree? I mean, it's very boring uh, uh, graph. 
This is, a, this is grabbed from experimental data. Very boring. But if we zoom in at the beginning, at the first two hours of the experiment, we see that it's not as boring. Why? We see that there is a, a pattern that is not linear. So the cells start from, from being immotile. And gradually, I mean, it's the front, right? It's just the front. Gradually, the front is becoming, is accelerating, becoming moving fast. So this is the acceleration. This is the derivative. It starts to move faster and faster until it reaches the steady state of motion that, that it goes at the, at, the, at the front, okay? So this is the, the reason why I think that this is the sweet spot and you'll see it is uh, where we want to focus on the beginning of the experiment as a model system, as a system to study how communication propagates from the front uh, to the back of the monolith. And the, the hypothesis here is that at the beginning, the cells at the front are very active. They know what's going on and they start moving. And as time goes by, not much, like only two hours, cells at the back already know, know where it's supposed to go and they join in. So cells at the back are starting to also be active in the migration. And then it gives more power to the whole collective and then the collective migrates uh, effectively. And in the next lesson, I'm going to show you uh, how we show that and how we understand that uh, something, some, some, some cool observation about how this communication is, uh, is going back and forth. Uh, I think it's enough for today. Questions, thoughts? Okay, so see you next week. Please come on time, cameras, etc. We have a guest lecture. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.